I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik, and today beside me, Mark Tier, we got Judge Jarzinka on this side of the camera. Yeah, heck yeah. Usually I'm on the other side, so this is, uh, but yeah, usually I'm on the other side of the camera in general, or I'm on the other side of the table. I don't right. know if I've ever said over here. Yeah, so. welcome to the big leagues. Yeah, I really feel the pressure over here. Uh-huh. Well, uh, don't feel the pressure. It's going to be a great podcast because we've got a special guest, a gentleman that you've hunted with a couple times, actually on in a couple different countries. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so join me in welcoming our special guest. We've got the president of Thompson Center Arms and the host of Huntmaster, Greg Ritz. Greg, thanks for taking your time and coming on the show. Oh, this is long overdue, guys. I really appreciate it. And we'll try not to get sidetracked with Judd and I talking about old hunting war stories here. We can talk about, you know, some of the uh, new and more relevant things that we're doing. Yeah, that's going to be a little tricky. So we'll see how <laughs> successful we are in that. <laughs> yeah, I feel like in the podcast for the viewers, we should overlay you know, the, the coos deer, that monster buck you killed up on Greg's farm there, just so we they should. can see what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. There is a little bit of a backstory there. So it was a few falls ago now, uh, Greg invited me out to come hunt whitetail with him at his Illinois property. And you want to talk about a dream paradise. That place is spectacular, Greg, that, that what you have done to that place for whitetails is incredible blew my mind and i'm a whitetail guy yeah that place was spectacular so well we had a good time and i put you to work the day before so you you did you did earn the right to come hunting that's for sure it it was a lot of fun yeah we ran cards we hung some stands we we checked some different areas out yeah stretch fence well yeah greg says that's work but he and i both we love that just as much as the hunt so yeah we were uh, i was like a kid in the candy store at that place no doubt it did Stands to reason, obviously, Greg, you've been in this industry a really long time. You know this industry in and out, and you wouldn't, as a as a industry professional, you don't hang around something unless you are truly passionate about it. And no one can argue about your passion about the outdoors, whitetail hunting, and hunting in general. And you've been a long long time friend of Jason Hornady. Obviously, he's big into hunting, so the relationship between Greg Ritz and Hornady goes way way back. But I want to get a little bit more information out of you because there's been some some changes in the industry, if you will. And I mentioned it when I introduced you to the podcast, the president of Thompson Center. And Thompson Center for me, when I hear the words Thompson Center, I'm instantly snapped back. It's December, it's snowing, it's 20 degrees outside, and my dad's got a TC Encore 50 cal mm-hmm. muzzle loader, and we're hunting in Nebraska. And I, you know, 12 year old Seth is is bundled up and that's what I think of about Thompson Center. Uh, and there's a lot more than that, but you are, I would say, reviving the brand at this point. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're completely relaunching the, the company. You know, uh, a lot of people know, and for those people listening now who don't know, uh, yeah, I went to Thompson Center originally, um, which I got to blame Jason on this, by the way. This, this, was, all his, this, was, all, this was all his doing. Uh, 1996. And, and, and I say that actually truthfully. So, um, and you guys may have heard the story, may not, but uh, Thompson Center was was looking for a sales manager. Jason and I were both in two different rep groups running the Midwest. He was with Sportco Marketing. I was with uh, Haber Jeruso at the time and running the same customers, the same trap lines, you know, working the same promotions. And he actually interviewed for the job at Thompson Center before me. So how do you like that? Because that because the rep group he is working for represented Thompson Center. Okay. And uh, you know, and Jason, you know, at the time said, Hey, you know, um, that's not I don't want to move to New Hampshire or whatever reasons. Like that wasn't right for me in my career path. And uh so he's you know, he interviewed with Bob Gustus and the owner, and he said, um, but I know a guy that you need to talk to. And uh, so Jason says, hey, listen, I hope you don't mind. I threw your hat in the ring for this potential job. And I'm like, why would you do that? Like, life <laughs> is good, right? Because I'm representing, you know, Lou Pold and some other big lines. I'm running the Midwest. I'm, you know, shooting trap on weekends and hunting big bucks in the Midwest. And he said, you got to give this a serious look. So I did. And several months later, um, I'm like, you know what? I can just pack my bags and, and 
hang up my hat as a rep and then pick up my hat as a, as a sales manager at, at Thompson Center. And that's how it started back in 96. Wow. So, uh, yeah. So it's, so, so this whole legacy of Thompson Center started, you know, because of, of, of Jason, uh, believing that I could make a difference in the gun industry. Poor guy. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> you, you, you obviously did. And maybe before we dive in too much, Judd, you got a question here quick before Wait, we I, shift gears. I was just curious what that shift looked like for you. Did you have to relocate then to go to Thompson yep. Center? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so, so I grew up in Maryland. Uh, okay. So, I mean, I grew up on the East Coast, uh, you know, then went to school in Ohio at Ohio Wesleyan. And then uh, then I went back to Maryland and Pennsylvania to back to Ohio as a rep, just kind of, you know, developing different territories. But I was living in uh, just north of Cincinnati at the time, Fairfield, Ohio. So now you've taken somebody out of the Midwest. I went to school there, college. And then, I mean, I love the Midwest. It had everything I wanted. And now to go back to the East coast, but then to the Northeast, like, it's like, where's New Hampshire on the map now? It's like one of those yeah, little right. states up there somewhere, <laughs> that right? little guy? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I tell you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to move now. I, I love living here. I travel a lot, but when I come back, it's, it's, it's home. I mean, I've been here for, for you know, 20, I don't know, 25 years or, or, yeah. or so. Well, that's good to hear that it's, it's home. And I've got some personal friends from New Hampshire and they, Love that place. Nothing but good things to say about it. So, and it is Gun Valley, right? I mean, th this it, is, it is. You, if you, th you know, if you, obviously, you know, way back time machine back to the 1800s, right? Uh, when you had Colt and Winchester and Browning, then obviously Ruger came onto the scene and Thompson Center and Savage. And we're, we're in this bubble now. Some of these companies are starting to move to, to more friendly states. Sure. Um, but it's interesting that you're there coming to New Hampshire as Ruger and Sig and Thompson Center and Wilcox and some of these other companies, or you're, you're going to other States, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, have a better, uh, political alignment yeah. with the gun industry. New Hampshire seems like the Haven, you know, up in that, that little region. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, I wanted to kind of approach this topic chronologically, if you will, and we kind of jumped in kind of in the middle there, uh, which is exciting. And for the listener that's maybe not super familiar with Thompson Center, I'd like to to get your take on kind of the history of the company and then tie that into your history with the company, because I think it's a, it's a cool story. Yeah, it's so um, so KW Thompson Tool Company, which was an investment casting company, uh, was founded by Ken Thompson in Long Island. And then, uh, you know, looking at the workforce, uh, the cost of manufacturing, regulations for investment casting, it wasn't the right place to grow and expand a business. So uh, he relocated the business to New Hampshire. And if so, I mean, if you go, if you go back to the fifties and think about this, you know, the shoe mills, the woolen mills, the tanneries, you know, we're starting to see the shift uh, in big logging. Um, mm. so a lot of really good, hard working, dedicated labor force was starting to get displaced. So, uh, he worked it out with the state and, uh, they provided the means and he, you know, came to Rochester, New Hampshire, which at that time we're talking the sticks. So, I mean, we only have like 1.2 million people in the entire state of, uh, New Hampshire. Anyway, you guys probably, you know, have more mule deer and antelope in the state of Nebraska than we have yeah. people. More cows. We got more cows. Yeah. <laughs> we don't beat you on population by much. So I think we're at like 1.5 million or so. Yeah. So, uh, so Ken Thompson comes up here and Bob Gustafson and Joe Barry were his first employees. And what time frame are we looking at into the 50s, 60s 50s. now? Yep. In the 50s. the 50s. Okay. So, uh, then in, uh, then in 1965, uh, Warren Center was working for H&R, Harrington Richardson, uh, mm -hmm. in, in Connecticut, and he was one of their lead designers. But on weekends, he's a tinkerer. He's a gun designer. So he comes up with this interchangeable single shot handgun and goes to H&R, right? Who they, I mean, they're making break open long guns, right? Right. F fantastic uh, company. And he goes, hey. I've made this on my own time. Do you guys want to bring this out? And uh, H&R was like, no, nah, that's, you know, that doesn't fit the hunting space. It's not anything we're interested in and cool design, but ah, no, thank you. Well, Warren Center believes so much in his own design as a lot of, you know, artists do. Mm -hmm. uh, he goes, I'm going to bring it out anyway. 
but he needed investment castings to make you know, the, the trigger, the hammer, the receiver, the trigger, like a lot of the internal components. Again, you put your way back time machine on. We didn't have metal injector molding. We didn't have pedal powder metal, uh, molding. You know, we didn't have a lot of the technology we have today. They were cast from steel. That's why a lot of your mill spec parts, right? And ARs are, you know, from investment castings. So, uh, yeah. So he, so he goes to Ken Thompson, knocks on the door. And says, uh, hey, you want to make these parts? Ken Thompson's an om- entrepreneur. And he's like, ah, yeah, I'd love to make the parts. You want to make a gun company? <laughs> so, uh, so you got Ken Thompson, Warren Center, become Thompson Center Arms. Oh. So, yeah. So the foundry continues to operate as KW Thompson Tool. We're now Thompson Investment Castings. So that was an independent company on the same premises. And they literally built a gun company around vertical manufacturing. And so in 67, they bring out the contender pistol. And yeah. immediately, immediately, people like silhouette shooting started to take it. Like the, the timing yep. was right. The timing was right, especially for silhouette shooting in that kind of sport. Yeah. And, and it, was, uh, it was really well revered. And then, of course, anything that's modular, you know, which is obvious today, right? right. AR-15s, 1022s, a lot of things that allow you to accessorize. Well, back then, nobody could accessorize a firearm. So now you could really just swap a barrel out and I can put a 35 whaling on this, right? I can put a, you know, wh- what yeah. other wildcat 30, 30. they wanted to? 30, 30 yeah, on the it? wildcatting yep. was taken off too. And you look at some of those contender barrels, we've got a slew of them in our vault chambered in just the most random stuff that you've never, you know, 30, 30 Winchesters neck down to six millimeter right. and yeah, 22 Hornets and you name it. Right. So think about where Hornady was in the mid sixties, right? As far as developing ammunition, the different types of ammo that was coming in the marketplace, there was this flywheel that started to go on ammunition development and uh, commercial ammunition development, right? Bullet, bullet styles, things of that nature. So people could play by buying a barrel. So then yep. in 1970, so most of their sales were, you know, spring and summer and a little bit in fall because handgun hunting hadn't quite taken off yet. In sure. 1970, they're like, hey, we need a, uh, another gun to balance out our production. And uh, Warren Center, you know, he's tinkering on this gun and that gun. And he goes, well, you know, let's build a muzzleloader. Okay. So he builds the Hawken yep. muzzleloader. Cap Classic. Lock. Classic. Well, what they didn't know, and they kind of dumb luck, a lot of companies have this breakout moment. 1972, you know, the movie comes out, Jeremiah Johnson, with Robert oh, Redford. Uh-huh. And, you know, Hatchet Jack is frozen frozen to death, right, with his hawk and rifle. And there's the note, right? Yep. You know, that whoever findeth my body, I bequeath this gun to him. You know, the bear done killed me, right? And so... Robert Redford pulls the uh, the gun out of Hatchet Jack's hands, and then the movie goes on from there, and a boom! It just explodes with sales. How because people about all that? all wanted all wanted a Hawken. Perfect and timing. Then, perfect timing. And then uh, and then then Tom, of course, at that same time, think about the whitetail world. The whitetail world back in the early seventies was the population was just starting to grow. Like if you really go back to, to look at where the population exploded for whitetails, everyone is going to tell you in the mid seventies. I mean, we take it for granted now, right? There's a, yes, there's yeah. lots of whitetail opportunity. I mean, there, there were farmers tell you back in the sixties that we never saw a deer track in Ohio. What do you mean you didn't see yeah. a deer track in Ohio or Illinois or Iowa? But back in the 60s, they weren't there. 70s, that, because big ag started, right? Sure. The corn, the beans, and it just, we had this deer factory that, that kicked off. So then Thompson Center said, oh, we'll capitalize on that. We'll work with state agencies. And how do we develop a muzzleloading season? Because if we have a special mm-hmm. season, people are going to buy a gun. Wow. So, Did you, so yeah. T, yeah, so TC knocked on, on the state doors. Made the pre so so this was a way increase revenue, increase hunter participation, increase opportunities, you know, help them manage deer herds. And uh, and so TC was at the forefront in developing every single muzzle loading season that we take for granted today. Like we we go into Nebraska, okay, we'll go buy our muzzle loading tag. 
where did that start? Like somebody wow. had. Somebody had to go to fishing game. Fishing game didn't wake up one day and go, "Hey, we need a muzzleloader." Let's have season. a muzzleloader season. I did yeah. not know that. That's Holy a cool cow. piece of history right wow. there. Well, yeah. in Nebraska too. Hey, I'm I'm all about the muzzleloader season. We get thirty days, thirty one, thirty one days, the whole month of December for a muzzleloader season, and our rifle season is only a nine day season. So, I'm all about that muzzleloader season. Yeah, I'm glad we have it and. Right, and if I remember the stories correctly, I think your wife uh, likes the muzzleloader season too, right? Yeah, she definitely does, yeah. <laughs> yep, she has good success with that, yeah. Yep, because I think she was out hunting when we were uh, hunting uh, yep. mule deer together, wasn't she? Yep, she That's... definitely she definitely was. Yeah, she was just like yeah. his wife. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yep, yeah, she is, uh, she's a diehard, yeah, I lucked out there. Yeah, it's, uh, so... So that became the big boom. Then, of course, CBA, you know, came around, then traditions came around. And and then, of course, anytime you have critical mass, you know, uh, just the whole marketing around the sport really started to to explode. At the same time, then handgun hunting started to explode. And and then Thompson Center really, you know, just had this, you know, meteoric rise. And then in, let me try to think about this early, I think it was the early 90s. Um, excuse me, it was in the 80s, MK84, I think it was the gun that Tony Knight came out with. Oh, yep. So he came out with the first inline muzzle loader with a removable breech plug. And that helped to simplify the sport and modernize it. Right now, it's e- easy to put a scope on it, yeah. which then allowed for more accuracy, longer ranges, you know, better bullet technology, um, and you know, faster twist rates and barrels. So now the race for technology starts. So, you know, TC, you know, so Tony Knight, so what TC helped create a foundation for, Tony Knight said, we can do better. Took it to the next and level. He took it to the next level. And, and you know, TC was a little slow to the dance on that one, you know, because our sales are still growing. Customer service was phenomenal. Warranty repair, lifetime warranty. People just bought the tried and true. But then technology, you know, eclipse that brand, uh, those brand attributes. And, uh, and yeah, so then we started to go the other way. Yeah, as Tony Knight back, though. Yeah. Is, yeah is, is coming up this way. And that really brings us to the point where Bob Gustinson said, hey, we need to bring in some younger talent people, understand the marketplace better, more to, because the dynamics are shifting. The, the Bass Pro are growing. The Cabela's are growing. Like the, the industry is changing now in the in the 90s dramatically and uh you know and even independent retailers are getting larger and putting together buying syndicates with mbs and sports inc and and uh so that's when he you know talked to jason and then jason passed the baton to me and uh that's that's what got me to new hampshire awesome that's such a cool story about the 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 founding of the company their influence on muzzle loaders as a whole and not just like, oh, the physical muzzleloader you hold in your hand, but the, the, the idea of hunting with a muzzleloader, getting regulations in place, getting seasons in place. That it's just remarkable that that all started with just a tinkerer yep. and a guy that owned a foundry. Just yep. remarkable. I love that part of the story. The Hornady Security Fireproof Keypad Safe. With a heavy-duty 16-gauge steel body, extra-thick 8-gauge steel door, and four 1-inch diameter locking lugs, the Fireproof Safe achieves a fire rating of 30 minutes for up to 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. Both the interior and adjustable shelf are covered in a protective carpet that offers flexible storage configurations while safeguarding valuables from damage. The Fireproof Keypad Safe from Hornady Security. Here's another cool, cool story about TC that nobody knows about. Um, and I, I, I'll talk about this on a YouTube here and, you know, another, another couple of weeks, but I'll let, I'll let you guys, uh, oh. kind of share the information. And I teased it a little bit. If you saw the YouTube with, uh, uh, me moving the product out of Smith and Wesson. Yep. So, uh, so Warren center obviously was a master gun builder, right? So there were a lot of guns that he built that never saw the light of day. So, uh, one of the, one of the, one of those guns was a falling block rifle. Okay. Okay. So, so he built a falling block rifle, goes to shot show with it. 
And, uh, so of course back in Shasha wasn't as big and grand, right? They were more like card tables and pop-ups. They weren't million dollar booths. That we, yeah. That we see today. So, uh, so he, you know, unzips the gun case and puts his beautiful falling block rifle out on the table. Okay. One of one. That's it. And, uh, so on day two, he hears all this commotion down the hallway and, uh, hear that what's going on down there. So he walks down there and it's at the Ruger booth. And there was Bill Ruger in the booth with the Ruger number one. So mm. two New Hampshire gun designers, Bill Ruger, and Warren Center, independent to one another. We're only, I don't know, hour from Ruger. Wow. That's it. Designed the same gun, styled differently, obviously, um, a little bit mechanically different, but same concept. But he, at that point, he was already tooled up. He was already to take orders. Warren Center was there more to test the marketplace. Ah. Uh-huh. So, Warren, so Warren hangs his head low and walks back, takes the gun off the table, puts it in a gun case. Never has the world seen that gun since that day. Wow. And you are in possession of it? How cool so, is that? Yeah. So there's only two in the world. So he built one. Um that uh, and then he, well, he built two. One he kept in what we so our design center at the old Thompson Center facility we called the chapel. It was an independent building uh, that uh, kind of looked like a chapel is why we called it that. And so he kept one in the design center there, and he kept one for his own personal gun collection. So when he passed away, they had a public auction. A public auction, and it's really <laughs> funny. You should hear Art Lamontang, who is the um, president of the TCA Collectors Association tell the story because one is funny because it's in that good New England accent. Oh, sure. Um, so so everybody shows up at Warren Center's house for this public auction, right? Because nobody's ever been in Warren Center's house before, right? Very, very few people. With a master gunsmith, the Tinker's Basement, right? And uh, it's like, you know, going into Matt McPherson's, you know, design center at Matthews, right? Like nobody goes in there. And uh, so, you, you know, you go into Oz's behind the curtain. <laughs> and uh, so people walk in and they start opening the gun safes and there's no guns in the gun safe. And people are like, oh, my God, what's happening? What's going on? Uh, well, somebody wrote a check before it started and bought all the guns. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> so that was me. So, uh, so you oh, got him, oh, 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 my man. So, well, I say me. Tom, Thompson Center did. So it's it's yeah. such a funny story because the um, so because I wanted to preserve that history. Right? Absolutely, you have and, to. Uh, right. So we so we we bought those guns and and we you know packaged up nicely and then uh, then obviously when Smith and Wesson purchased the company, they got all the guns. And uh, so I'll, I'll never forget this story. So Daniel Sambo, who was working for Smith & Wesson at the time, uh, she uh, found out that the falling block rifle was for sale. And uh, so she purchases it in the marketplace. So, th- But what she didn't know is that was the one that was in the design center. So she thought she was buying gun one of one. Mm. And she was actually buying number two of two. So, hmm. so Smith and Wesson ended up at, with both falling block uh, rifles, and uh, so we're gonna we're gonna do a whole YouTube just on that gun, go through the design of it, and actually shoot it. Oh wow! What's it chambered in? Yeah, it's uh, chambered in three hundred eight. Perfect. Wow, that is super cool. Well, yeah. this kind of sounds like maybe a turning point where you have the the passing of the tinkerer of you know the gunsmith side of it, uh, and I don't know if maybe turning point's not the right word, but so you get into bolt action rifles. At what point did that start? And then, you know, that kind of transition to, you know, a big change in Thompson Center, just getting, I feel like, eclipsed by technology, just like you'd mentioned earlier, with so much competition in the marketplace that kind of just got shadowed out at some point. So absolutely. And, and there's one other piece of, of the history. And again, you know, maybe you've got a younger audience listening who doesn't know this. You guys probably remember it. So in 19, 1997, uh, I believe was the fire at, at mm. Thompson Center, uh, 97, 98, somewhere, somewhere in there. 
uh, in March. And, uh, and it destroyed a third of the manufacturing facility. Woof. So it's, so we used to be vertical. So we had a sawmill in Prairie, Kansas. We would buy the logs, blank the logs, kiln dry the wood, ship it to New Hampshire, hand carve, hand sand, hand spray the stocks, like the original Hawkins stocks, everything wood that we did, we did all of it. So we did the investment castings, we did the barrel making, we did the stocks, and the fire started in the wood room and uh, and brought the company to its knees, like literally stopped the company in, a, in oh, its tracks. Oh, my gosh. Because, Understandably so. Yeah, because uh, test shooting, assembly, uh, you know, the, the wood shop, everything just came to a halt. Um, and it was crazy because the day after the fire, you know, all the employees show back up for work. And Bob Gustafson, you know, said, I don't know what we're going to do. Like, we got to assess this. We got to talk to the insurance company. Like, I don't know what to tell you, but I'll do my best to bring everybody back to work. But I, I can't pay you. Like, I don't have anything for you to do. And uh, those employees said, we're not here to get paid. We're here to help. And they mm-hmm. rooted through the ashes, picked up parts, cleaned things, shoveled debris. Denver got paid. That's saying wow. something. Because they cared about the company. They cared about the customer, the people who could answer the phones, answer the phones and told people in the marketplace, you know, hey, this is what's going on. And, uh, and Bob remembered that and hired every single one of them back. That's Everybody. a pretty cool part of the story, too. Wow. That is, yeah, yeah I, I didn't know it ended like that. That's, yeah, that's, it, uh, it, but it's a made, passionate it, workforce. It, yeah, it made us stronger and it really galvanize the culture of the company. And, and, and I wanted to tell that story because that's what we're rebuilding now. That culture. That culture, right? The, the culture and the people, just like Hornady, right, is what Hornady is to ammunition. Leupold is to optics. Reconics is to game cameras. Matthews is to bows. I can go right down the list. I can give you 100 companies that are privately owned, family owned, but believe in people. Mm-hmm. I, w- I was there for your 75th anniversary. I was in, I was in Grand Island and I saw the people. You were too. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, but, but that was a celebration of people. It wasn't a celebration of the company. It's a celebration for people, of the employees. Exactly. And I, I noticed that. I'm glad you brought that up and you verbalized it a lot more, uh, a lot better than I ever could because I was trying to explain that to my family that had asked about that 75th party. and. I had a hard time verbalizing like the Hornadies did not have to do that yeah. celebration. They've already celebrated that, you know, they're, they're a successful business. They did their celebration right. and shot show. They didn't have to do that. They did it for their employees. Right. They did it for their community. And, and that was really cool to be a part of. And it was, I mean, you could feel it when you were there. Everybody yeah. was proud to be part of the team Hornady. They, they, they were proud. So it's that rebuilding of the culture and what's good is I have several of the, the employees uh, who used to be with Thompson Center coming back either full-time or part-time working with me now because they are the culture. So not only do I need their help and their history of firearms and, and what to get started, but I want them to define for the younger people as now as we're bringing in new engineers and, and we're staffing, it's like train the trainer, right? Yeah. So, so, you know, yeah, old school and new school. So we, but I want them to to bring that culture and teach that culture because that's how we're going to become a great company and maintain and maintain the legacy is the people Absolutely. and the culture. Yeah, we'll come that up is with the cool, legacy. Right, that that's the DNA, and um, the DNA was different when it went to Smith and Wesson. Doesn't make it right. Doesn't make it wrong. Smith has her own DNA, which is super successful, um, but it's not the DNA of TC. So Mm -hmm. I want to make sure as we relaunch, and that's why we're in Rochester, New Hampshire. Like we're two miles from the original site of the factory. The old factory has been, you know, Smith moved everything in 2010 uh, down to Springfield. And uh, so that site got cleared. And, you know, there's uh, (laughs) what's really funny is, you know, who's around the corner right now from the from the original Thompson Center plant? Sig Sauer. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! Sig just built a new, camp, a new campus, 
um, hired 600 people. But it's so funny how the vision, you know, of Ken Thompson and Warren Center was we need to be here. And now the rest of, uh, you know, these big young companies are, are coming are, back. Are, yeah, are, are, are coming back. But that's, uh, but yeah, so we had, we had to fight and claw our way back. And, and the gun that did that was the Encore. Yeah. So the, en- the Encore was originally designed as a, a hand cannon. Right, a big bore pistol, and uh, so we had this fire. So our sales are going like this, right? We had the fire, which stops everything, and, uh, and then Bob Gustafson says, "What do we do? What do what do we do to his to his key group of people?" And uh, he said, "What products do we make? Like, how do we turn this around? We can buy equipment. We have great people, but what do we build?" Like, it, you know, wh- where's our, where's our future? And, um, you know, and what's great is we ha- we have incredible connections in the marketplace. And, uh, and I go out in the marketplace and, and I'm talking to people and standing behind counters trying to figure out what, what do we do? And, uh, we get the design team back together, uh, after, after my little whirlwind trip around, uh, the country and, uh, and basically take a whiteboard. Say, okay, Pirate X pellets are coming out. Okay, what about we use three of them? We make a Magnum muzzle loader. What's the Magnum muzzle loader? Well, it shoots 150 grains of powder. Can it shoot 200 yards? Right. Okay, write, write that on the whiteboard. Okay, obviously, you've got every removable breech plug. Uh, how are we going to aim with this thing? Let's put fiber optic sights on. Nobody had fiber optic sights on a muzzle loader. Mm-hmm. Oh, let's yeah. Put fiber, late, yeah, late 90s. Right? Yeah, but let's drill and tap it for a scope base. So they could put a giant scope on it if they want to. Okay, what do we do? Well, we got to make it easier to load. Uh, we got to ignite all this powder. Let's use a 209 primer. Nobody's used a 209 primer yet. Mm, so, holy cow. Now that's in right, I didn't right know there. any of this. Yeah, wow. Yep. yep. So we so we design so we go, okay, well, we'll figure out how, you know, because we're dealing with a center fire action now. So it was a pistol modified to become a muzzle loader because we had to ship something in six months. <laughs> and uh, so like, okay, well, we, I, we can use an extractor to pull the primer out to make it feel like a center fire gun. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. That's a great idea. And uh, so they're like, well, let's make the barrel longer because we don't have an action on an encore, right? It's not like a b- bold action. Or, so sure. let's make the barrel 26 inches, right? So it's longer barrel, shoots further, more deadly. So literally whiteboarding with, with the designers and engineers. And they're like, all right. So then the mad scientists go to work, Mark Laney and Carl Ricker and Ken French and all the guys that in, in the design center. And they, in six months, come out with the Encore. And they, oh. so they, they, they come and out with it. I remember the number one selling muzzle letter at the time was a Wolverine, 299 bucks. Number one guy by unit volume. It was everywhere. You guys probably even remember it. And uh, they're like, okay, we price it all out, right? Because now it's investment cash receiver interchangeable. It's an FFL gun too, right? And they're like, ah, oh, let's make it interchangeable with center fire. They're like, oh, brilliant. So I go go out and I remember calling an AccuSport at the time. You guys probably remember them. They're not even in yep. business, big wholesaler. Going to Ron Davis, I'm saying, oh, my God, I got to show you this new gun, blah, 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 blah. This is it. This is our breakout moment, right? Our, our birth from the ashes, right? And uh, he goes, how much is it? And I said, it's going it's to retail for six, seven hundred bucks. He goes, oh, no, never sell. Never sell. No way. <laughs> no way. Can't. Nobody's going to buy a $700 muzzle loader. I can buy a Wolverine for 300 bucks. Ron. Like, you got to work with me here. Like, if I don't come back with an order, you know, this may not go anywhere. He goes, okay. <laughs> he said, I believe in TC. I believe in the brand. If, if you say it's going to sell and you're going to put the marketing behind it that you tell me to, because at the time, remember, now we're promoting things on television. So that, that time is when the outdoor channel is taking off. Mm-hmm. So the marketing vehicles change. I'm like, don't worry. I got Waddell. I got Shockey, get the Drewers, got Ralph and Vicky, right? And you I got, got Lee and, Ch- I got Lee and Tiffany. I got Whitetail Freaks. I got House. Like I got 
I got all the NASCAR players of hunting. I said, trust me, it's going to sell. Of course, I do this little tap dance, you know, around the whole country. And poof, the encore becomes the most iconic muzzleloader since the Hawken. No doubt. Like if anyone tells you of what guns you remember, I remember a Hawken. I remember an encore, both by TC. Yeah. Well, 100%. Wow. I, I, you explained me to a T of that story I shared at the beginning. That's what I think of. And you want to talk about revolutionizing the sport of muzzleloading. The Encore did it. That's yeah. remarkable. I did not know that that was the first muzzleloader with a 209 primer. Well, yep. that backstory to me is what is super interesting. I mean, with your back against the wall, that was Come out the swinging. brightest moment. Yeah, that, that oh, is it, incredible. It, 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 was, it was literally the jump from the, the, the rooftop and hope you land and catch your fingers. And, uh, you, you know, caught we, your uh, fingers and then some. Yep. And, uh, but it came from the people. Right. We listened to the marketplace. We had great people. Obviously, you had a good brand. Right. We had we were known for customer service and lifetime warranty and, and great products. But it was that it was that back against the wall. That's a great way. It's, it's like this is do or die, guys. Let's let's put all our chips on the table. And uh, and then from there, TC just, you know, then the Omega came out and the Black Diamond came out. And then to your point, and then we're like. Time to do time to spread our wings. Everybody knows this for great rifle barrels. Let's build a bolt action. But yeah. if we build it, let's go build the best bolt action. And and that's what we did with the the icon. I mean, we we literally came to Hornady and said, help us design, you know, a, the best bolt action. We go to George Gardner, like literally to his shop, GA Precision. George, what do you want to see in this? He goes, well, let's open up the vault. I like it, this and this, and I changed this. So here, here's the cool thing. Thompson Center was the first commercial gun company to use Cerakote on a gun. Mm. That's the industry standard now. Yeah. Not necessarily the standard, but everybody's for, for doing it. For coatings? Absolutely. Yeah. And, but we called it Weather Shield because we wanted a cool tra trade name. But mm -hmm. those are the things because George Gardner – you know, he goes and he goes, oh, let's spin this barrel off and I'll show you this receiver. He spins it off and like Carl's going, oh, my God, what are you doing? You're going to mark your barrel up. He goes, I'm going to mark my barrel up. It's got Cerakote on it. It's got what? He goes, yeah, it's got this military coating on it. He's like, it's impervious to rust, tough as nails, won't scratch. You're like, ah. Oh, we need that. We need that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but being being that small company or being privately owned like like a Hornady, right? Hornady, you guys can think of something and go build it. Like as long as Jason agrees and Steve agrees or doesn't know, it'll get done. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Black you can, ops. Yeah. yeah, we do some uh yeah, skunk works kind of stuff. Hornady Outfitter Ammunition is now loaded with Hornady CX bullets. Its optimized monolithic design combined with a heat shield tip offers extended range performance, enhanced accuracy, high weight retention, and deep penetration. Outfitter ammunition features corrosion-resistant nickel-plated cases that are sealed watertight, designed to perform under the toughest conditions. No matter where adventure takes you, trust your hunt to Outfitter Ammunition from Hornady. So you come out with the Icon and... That was my first experience with Thompson Center Bolt Action Anything uh, long after the Icon came out. I bought a TC Icon and 30 TC, of all things, in 2013 or 14. Action with a little butter knife bolt handle was yeah. just like, yeah, ice on glass, smooth, yeah, sexy looking, shot really well. I mean, it was a fantastically built rifle. That was my first experience yeah. with one, and, and it was a shame that they weren't more available at today because they are fantastically built. And like I said, those actions are just super smooth. Well, and, and, and that's, and that takes us to the transition. So in 2007, two things happen. We launched the icon in Smith and Wesson buys Thompson center. So those happen right at the, the same time, which by the way, just as another little uh, cool history fact, the Icon wasn't the first bolt action Thompson Center built. Really? Warren Center had built a bolt action previously that never saw the light that yeah, that never that never saw the light today. 
So I'll so, be patiently waiting for these YouTube videos to come yeah, out that you post yeah, where you unearth it, these things. It, it, yeah, exactly. And we'll, so we'll have to take it for a test drive with a little Hornady ammo. Sounds uh, like a, yeah, match based. So, so, the, so the icon comes out and when Smith acquires TC, their mindset is um, how do we produce volume? And they, so you look at a thousand dollar bolt gun and they're like, well, we could sell whatever, 10, 20, 500 times more if we get that price point down to six or 700. So they create the Venture Bolt Gun, which was a hybrid of the Icon. We took off the Picatinny rails. We changed the bottom of the receiver, right? Changed some metal finishing, you know, did some things to reduce cost. Still a great gun, no question. But, you know, it was at a price point now that uh, was more achievable. And then they bought built the compass, which was then, so they gave you the kind of the good, better, best. Well, you know what happens is yep. the, the icon lost the attention, lost the luster, never continue to evolve into other calibers, uh, you know, in configurations. And, uh, and basically only saw the light of day for a few years. Now that will be coming back out in the marketplace for next year. I, mm. I was about to, to bring this up as we tr transition to the future because you just put out a YouTube video or a series of YouTube videos, you know, about TC and you did one where you're up at uh, the Madras facility at loophole shooting the warlord. Yeah. And I want to tell you that warlord rifle in its original configuration was so ahead of its time. It's not even yeah. funny. People are building rifles near identical to that today yeah. to yeah. go compete in stuff like PRS or just yeah. coyote hunting or long range target yeah. shooting. It was configured so perfectly for 2020 and 2022, three, four, whatever, but in 2008 and nine. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 exactly. So what's great is we have the DNA of the platform and there's going to be some other changes. And yes, are we going back to the PRS world, the George Gardner's, the custom guys and saying, hey, here's our platform. What do you do? Oh, I take a little bit of weight out of here, right? I change the bolt angle. Like we know so much more about precision rifles today than we did back in 2010. Sure. Because the people have put so much time. You've got some incredible actions out there, right? By defiance and impact. And I mean, just go right yeah, the down. The list goes the, on and on. Right, right down, right down the list. And uh, so we're like, okay, well, if we can deliver what defiance does but we can sell a whole gun for what they sell an action for we'll probably be successful i think you're gonna do okay now before we get there before we get into what the future holds for thompson center um you made a departure from thompson center and then ended up coming back how did that transition go going out and then coming back in so so i spent two years at smith and wesson um as their president of the hunting division so i ran thompson Good. center and then, you know, launched the hunting and was part of the whole long guns of, uh, of, of Smith & Wesson. They had their eyeballs. They had their shotguns at their time. You know, they were just launching ARs. So I was part of that whole, whole group. And then uh, so my um, employment agreement came up. They're like, hey, we want you to move to Springfield. You're a great member of the executive team. I love working for Smith. Like it was, you know, you're working for a legendary company. Yeah. But they were publicly held. You know, they were, you know, they had a different way of going to the marketplace than an entrepreneur would go. Sure. And I said, you know, guys, I don't know that I want to move to Springfield. I want to be an ambassador. Like, I, I, I want you, you know, I want to keep using your product. I want to film with it on TV. I want to celebrate you on social. I, I just don't, I don't want to move to Springfield and be part of the big blue machine. And they're like, boy, that really, you know, leaves us with a hole. And uh, so then when I left a year later, they closed the Rochester facility down. Oh, and it, wow. And it, and it broke my heart. Sure. Beca because I'm a like. A lot of people, I'm sure. I, I was like, it's, it's my fault. Like, I felt it was my fault. Because had I stayed or had things transpired differently, those people would have had jobs. Things wouldn't have changed. And, you know, I was asked the other day. Um, I think it was by Scott, Scott Olmstead, uh, American Hunter. And he said, uh, hey, wh what was the itch you needed to scratch? Like, why did you want to come back? And I said, it wasn't an itch. It was a pit in my stomach. 
Like I had an emptiness in my soul from not being connected to TC. And, you know, I started Wildcom, very successful. You know, uh, you know, we deal with 300 companies in this industry, right? Every major company, guns, ammo, optics, archery, doesn't matter. We, you know, we have some type of affiliation with them, with all the brands that we represent and things that we do on the marketing side, but it never had that fulfillment TC did. And uh, so then end of last year, um, Glenn Butcher get calls me and, uh, and you guys, you know, sell product to him. He's, he owns Bass and Bucks in Wabash, Indiana. And I knew Glenn for years because he, he was one of our best dealers for Thompson Center. And he goes, hey, Glenn, Greg, this is Glenn. He would stay in touch now and again, like you, know, like you do with the Todd Vances of the world and other retailers, right? You, you just have a right. network out there because I was still known as the TC guy. Even though I wasn't with them, they go, oh, my God, did you see what they did over there? Oh, my God, could you believe this? Right? And uh, so he goes, do you want to get back in the game? I said, what do you mean? He said, if I, if we can bring this back as a family owned, privately owned business, uh, and I can help provide the backing, would you do it? Would you go run it? I'm like, oh man, like, and I had been asked dozens of times by private equity companies, investors, and other gun companies, hey, would you go? Nope, not interested. If it can't be the original TC, I want no part of it. Like, I, you know, I already took, uh, you know, my heart was ripped out once. And I want to have it ripped out again. So if we right. do it, we do it right. Let's do it right. And, uh, and, and we, we make it back to what it was. If, if that, like, hey, I'm cool. I'm good. Right. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, uh, you know, um, you know, I've got a really good partner in here, precision machining company called Global Precision Parts. The owner, uh, said that he's willing to back us with, you know, technology and, and financing. And, you know, I want to be a part of this because I understand the retailers and celebrate that. But he said, you got to run it. And I said, well, I don't, uh, I don't know if it's for sale. Because remember, they closed it down in 2021. Right. Shut it down. May of 2021. Lit- when I say shut it down, guys, because obviously you know, we talk openly about it because we own it. I'm talking they <laughs> hit the stop button. Like you would have on the, the, the button on a machine, like that panic button, like stop yep. the ride. Like, boom, stopped it. Frozen time. All the work in process, all the equipment got pushed to the corner or converted to make Smith & Wesson products. You know what? It was the right decision for Smith and the stockholders. They topped a billion dollars back in 2021. Mark Smith made a, a really good business decision. But Mark also felt, you know, um, an emptiness too, that this brand, because Mark's a hunter. Most people don't know that, right? Mark's, you know, from Vermont, loves to hunt. And he's like, man, it's just, it's not right to the marketplace. So I call Mark up and uh, actually got his contact information from Jason then. <laughs> and it all comes full circle here. It all comes full circle. And uh, so I'm like, Jason, what? I said, first of all, I call Jason and uh, and he'll tell you the story. I'm like, what do you think I should do? He goes, why are you calling me? I'm like, because you're my best friend and I want advice. He goes, don't ask me dumb questions. I'm like, don't ask hmm. And I'm like, oh. So don't ask you what I already have the answer to. He said, there you go. Pick up the phone, call the guy, get it done. The industry needs you. The brand needs you. We need you. Go get it done. Whatever it takes. Like, okay, gotcha. So I call Mark and takes my call. And, and Mark goes, uh, you better get me an NDA really fast. I'm like, okay. Pop, 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 pop. Easy, right? And he goes, okay. He said, um, there's some other companies right now that are trying to buy the brand. I'm like, oh, so now it's a competitive, this competitive process and the clock's ticking. He said, yeah, you're kind of behind. Like there's mm. other people further in the process. Mm. That's not what you want to hear. No. Now, the other part of that is I'm like, well, the good part is, Mark, there's nothing you're going to tell me I don't already know. Like, I really don't need a due diligence period because this is an IP purchase. We're buying the intellectual property, the patents, the trademarks, the designs, blah, 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 blah. So we, uh, you know, to his word, you know, we go through, give him a, a, an LOI and uh, literally get on the phone and negotiate. It. And he goes, let me call the board of directors. 
He goes, we, we feel that's fair. This is where it needs to be. It needs to come back to you. And he, you know, they, they were like for it, for a big publicly held company, the process was actually pretty seamless because obviously you're not, you're not purchasing liability. You're not purchasing a, you know, where you got to go do environmental studies and all this stuff, sure. right? You're buying a piece of paper, essentially. And whatever stuff is, you know, in their 600,000 square foot facility <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that they haven't, that they haven't lost or they haven't converted to Smith & Wesson. And uh, so, yeah, so it was done. And, and in April, I'm like, oh. What, what did, did I, I just, just do? What did I just get myself? Like the theory of it was so great. And like all, like that day that we signed the LOI, 100% tell you, I felt like I was whole again. I'm like, that's it. Like it, it would, like it was such a clear vision. And, you know, Carl Ricker, who is my director of engineering and Tyler Stone, who is my director of operations, and I go down the list of the important people. They go like, "You guys got to be a part of. It. If you're not in, I'm not in." Right? I can't rebuild this all on my own, and I can't rebuild the culture. They're like, "We're in. Let's go." Oh I'm wow! Like, I'm like, okay, like we don't really have a business plan here. They're like, just do what we did, just better. Do what so works. It, just. Just yeah, let's let's go do what made TC great, and just we'll make it happen. And so that's like we're moving stuff out. I mean, I think we we've had thirty some semi lows of stuff, like stuff <laughs> just arrive. Like we we have stuff arrive. Like uh, where did this come from? Like stuff that like literally went from New Hampshire to Springfield has come back. It it's is home again. The, it's in the same box. <laughs> Jeez. Wow. So that's, that's such a cool story and an exciting, and I can imagine, uh, t not tumultuous, but man, you better hope you made the right decision. And what are we going to do to rebuild this? And how are we going to get in our feet? And, you know, how are we going to stay on the right side of the checkbook here? Uh, such a, an exciting time, but I think you mentioned it that maybe Jason had said this to you, but like, you know what you need to do and just go do it. So I'm excited for the future because to me, the Thompson Center brand has, I have so many memories attached to it, just hunting with my dad with his TC Encore, which had a 50 cal muzzle loader barrel and a 308 Winchester barrel and a few others. I think he had a 220 Swift or something like that. Mm, yep, I mean, yep. I just remember that. And it's such a cool brand uh, and revolutionized the industry as we've learned. Find the latest shirts, hats, hoodies, and accessories that you see here on the podcast and much more at HornadyGear.com. So without asking too much, is there, what's on the horizon for Thompson Center? So you guys, you, you, you've got the ownership back, you're getting stuff aligned, you're getting people in the right positions. What are you going to build and, and uh, how are you going to get, you know, back to prominence, if you will? So. Um... Gr great question. The first thing is to relaunch the Encore, right? Because, yeah, that's, be, be, because it's a, it's a platform, right? And, um, and what I mean by that is we have technology we can bring to muzzle loading. We know on, so as crazy as this sounds, okay, the Encore was never produced with a threaded muzzle for suppressor or brake. Mm -hmm. Like, like, like really obvious, like low lying fruit that people be like, oh my God, I'd love to buy a 20 inch Katahdin barrel and put a can on done. Yep. You know, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you this and, and, you know, it won't be a secret in 30 days, but I don't care. You can let it out now. Um, nobody's going to beat me to the race anyway. We're going to have carbon fiber barrels. I will be hunting with carbon fiber barrels this fall on an encore. Oh wow! Oh, wow, that's, that is cool. That's going to be twenty first century muzzle loading <laughs> yep. right there. Yep, yep, and and ah, rifle. I like it. And think of this, and handgun. Oh yeah! Oh, think, dude. think about that fifteen inch Encore barrel, three hundred eight, thirty odd six, seven hundred eight with a brake on it, stainless steel brake, carbon fiber barrel. I mean, it will balance great. It will shoot great. It'll perform well in your hand. I mean, so so those are the cool things that while we're still you know, getting things going, we're, we're not going to like 
wait three years to start doing new cool stuff. Straight wall cartridges. Yeah. Obviously, you guys see the demand in the Midwest. Oh, yeah. The 350 Legend, the, the 450 Bushmaster, those, just those two specifically, and all, and the ubiquitous 4570. Those three. I mean, we could keep right. the we could keep our factory running with the lights on by just selling those three cartridges. Right. It so, seems right. So so we're going to have the three fifty legend and the four fifty Bushmaster out this fall. Are they going to be in any great quantities? No, but we, somebody will be, somebody there. will crack a deer right and with with one of the, with one of these this this fall. So and then uh, but we're going to bring handgun hunting and make that cool again. So there's a whole generation. So think about this. When Smith, so even though Smith hit the stop button in 2021, they really stopped engaging in the brand years before that. And, uh, they just started making more compass bolt action rifles. And, and I mean, they were making tens of thousands of them, right? And they were making them good. Don't get me wrong. But the whole brand never, um, got attached to the, to the young hunter, right? The 18 to 30 year old guy. You know, they didn't find the brand cool. There wasn't anything innovative, right? It was servicing the the older guys who grew up, you know, your dad or, or what have mm-hmm. you that, you know, shot shot an encore and, and now he wants a compass gun. But we want to make handgun hunting cool again. And like next spring, we will have we will have a handgun and four ten shotgun to go turkey hunting with. Oh heck yeah. Sign us up. Preston, yeah. you hear that back there? Yeah, yep. that'll get us excited. Yeah, and with, with a the handgun new, hunter with himself, the TSS yeah. lows now and four ten, like, and tell me that the that the, the younger kids, right? When I say younger, twenty five, like, you know, yeah. that's when Jason and I were 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 eating, you know, wings and and you know, trying to hawk product back in the day, uh, mm-hmm. you know, at a wholesaler show together. Um, those are the, those are the people we want uh, TC to be cool again, and yep. uh, it create that vibe. And obviously we want to, we want to, you know, work with you guys on what new ammunition do you have coming up? But if you have something that let's say it's the six PRC, okay, obviously it's already in the marketplace, but let's say that you were working on that and you're like, this is the perfect round for, for the PRS world. Fine. I'll go build you a PRS gun just for that cartridge. What do you want? Because we're privately owned, we're family owned and I can do whatever I want to do. Yeah. And if we move quickly. It's exactly right. I don't even have to worry about asking Steve. There is no Steve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's exciting. Well, there it sounds like there's a lot of cool stuff in the works, and the turkey hunting with a 410 pistol. Oh yeah, that that just got me all riled up because I've got young boys. Preston yeah. behind the camera, he's got young boys, and even just for for me, not a young boy out turkey hunting, that just sounds. Oh my gosh! Just yeah. the way to do it. <clears throat> yep, put a red dot on there. Sounds like a lot of fun. Oh, Man, it, to, it, to your point, Greg. <clears throat> though, just of Thompson Center and kind of the age. I'm 33 now. Just Happy as of, just as of yesterday. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I grew up. My family. My dad did some bird hunting. You know, pheasants were plentiful back then. But then big game hunting. You know, he really didn't do anything. So when I came up with the interest into hunting outdoor television was what i had and that would have been like early 2000s those would have been my young teen years yeah and yeah everything i learned was through hunting television at that time thompson center was the brand so hearing this now and just just thinking back to having some of those things back here in the future just gives me a warm and fuzzy it does yeah and now how we approach the marketplace is different right because now we have podcasts and we have youtube so you know how we how we disseminate the information is is a lot more personal than it, than it's ever been before, and and now we can interact with the community. We we you know mm-hmm. we can go on social media, we can look at comments on YouTube, and we know okay we want more of these calibers. Have you tried this? You know, change the stock configuration, and we just go we react. So we we try to be that that smaller you know, more personable company that is very reactive geographically, personally. I don't need to build 20,000 or something to go be profitable. That's not, that's not how, you know, we didn't inherit overhead. We, so we can go build the infrastructure to be highly uh, supportive to the marketplace. Fantastic. And one of the things that jumps out to me is, you know, you say bring back the, the encore. Well, of course, I mean, 
you guys are in the business of making encores. You did it so well for so long. Bring that back with just some little refinements, just that, you know, the threaded muzzle. Now with muzzle devices being so prevalent, just little things like that, that can just make a huge difference to the shooting experience. And, and now with the suppressor use being, I mean, the standard now, it seems like there's so many shops that made it so easy, Silencer Central and Silencer Shop specifically. Right. It's easy button to get a suppressor. And today they're turning them around in week, week and a half, you get your paperwork right. back. So you could go hunt with a muzzle loader suppressed, which is pretty right. wild, or swap that barrel out to anything you want. And to me, that's just bringing the, you know, the old school cool into the new age as well. Put the smile it, on my face. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, 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 exactly. And, and we, you know, we got some, uh, you know, some, some ideas that, uh, you know, for better triggers on the Encore. The Encore was good. I think during the, the Smith years, it was very safe, <laughs> you know, but you and I know what we want out of a trigger, right? Yeah. And obviously we'll always build a safe gun, but I, I just want that perfect trigger right there. You know, high two pound range, low three pound range, like, and it just breaks clean and it's super smooth. But now that little attention to detail, it's that last 10% that makes anything great. And yep. you just got to take that last 10% to really refine it, really polish it. And we're like, so when, when the new encores come out and you, you know, you try the triggers on the new ones coming out, because I've been shooting mine already, you're going to be like, oh man, you guys selling trigger jobs. Like, can I send my old encore back? And, uh, but those, but those little things. And then, like you say, you add a carbon fiber barrel, you add a, a you know, a suppressor on one additive, you know, it's going to be something cool. But right on the heels of that, the icon's coming back out. That's what I was, I was so excited to hear you mention that earlier in the podcast because I'm a bolt action fanatic and that was a great action. And I'm really excited to see what you do, not just to the, the action, of course but the whole rifle platform, you know, when you have all the modeling clay in front of you, you can make whatever you want. I'm really excited to see what you yeah. select. Oh, yeah. We, I mean, we've already made one that's, that's sub six pounds. <sighs> Ultralight. Ultralight. Now, are we going to have it out next year? Probably not. Are we going to be hunting with it this fall? Mm, probably. And, but I mean, it's, you know, again, because we could just go tinker and we're like, well, how, you know, how can we make the, an ultralight? Because there are a lot of people, you know, who are going on, you know, that are very fitness oriented, right? They're going more into the backcountry. They're doing harder core things, right? And uh, yeah. they just want want a rifle that uh, you know is is gonna gonna get them there. But it's gonna be specifically built for that that ultralight, you know, QU community, if you will, right? The, the, those uh, you know those backcountry guys, yeah. Uh, it's just it's fun because I I have I have no box to color in anymore, and it's just you just such got a, a whole blank page. Yeah, I just don't have I don't have enough time. That's the yeah, well, yeah. yeah, that's the hot commodity. But it sounds like the future incredibly bright for Thompson Center from awesome beginnings, and yeah, there's been some bumps in the road here or there. But it sounds like the trajectory that you guys are about to embark on is going to be uh, rapid. It's going to be fast, and it's going to be fun. Yep. Yep, and, and and it will, and 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 we're going to be authentic to the users, just like Hornady is, right? Yep. We're going to listen. We're going to have people on the phone for customer service. I know if they call for technical information, you know, to Hornady, you know, they 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 get somebody who who is authentic and shoots and is a ballistician and knows what they're talking about. And uh, so a lot of uh, what you guys embody in your brand, you know, we're going to you know take the same play, playbook and put it into ours. Great to hear. Judge, you got any questions for Greg and about Thompson Center while we got him on the line? I would just say, you know, Greg, where can we keep up with this? Where can we follow? Where's the best place? Uh, so, social media, uh, uh, website? Yes, yes, yeah. So, social media and, and uh, YouTube. We're redoing the website now. So that's going to launch here this fall. And uh, so okay. obviously that'd be the repository for everything. And obviously, you know, there'll be some, some cool swag on there as well once we uh, – once we, Get that, that up and going. Classic logo. Yeah, Love yeah, the classic yeah, like TC. That. And yep. uh, but um, but I would I would say you know Instagram and YouTube is we are gonna um, we're making a big commitment to show people what it takes to build a gun company, what it takes to bring products out, and uh, we'll be sharing them on your platforms. 
And uh, so if you guys release a new cartridge, we're going to you know build a gun around that and evaluate that and evaluate the cartridges. And, and we want to show people what we go through. I mean, we, we did a video last week. No gun company would have ever done this. We showed what happens when you put smokeless powder in a muzzle loader. Mm. Guess what happened? It went boom. Yeah. Right? yeah. And uh, but doing those things from an educational standpoint. So uh, so I would really encourage people, um, you know, to, uh, you know, subscribe to that platform and, and follow us on Instagram. Excellent. Is there anything else, Greg, that you want to leave the, the listener and the viewer with about you, your brands, your company? I think we, we really co- covered it. I mean, obviously, we're dedicated to made in America, USA workers, guys, j- you know, just like your brand, right? You know, you, you guys got red in your logo. I got red in my logo, right? We got red in our Love blood, it. right? And, and we're going to, we're going to be, uh, USA made lifetime warranty support to retailers. And, uh, and we're really going to, we're proud to make guns, right? We're not here as, as a business, you should be. right? We're, 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 we're here to, to identify as a movement in the industry. And I think seeing more people and inspiring people, uh, to be entrepreneurs, Right. And, and to follow your dreams. That's that's what we want to do. And if and if we can help showcase that and get people fired up about uh, guns and hunting and shooting, you know, that's just, that's the legacy we want to leave. Right. At the end of the day. Right. That's what we, we want to do. Like, yeah, I'm Love pretty fired up right now. I'm for fired up. Yeah. Take my money. Where can I? Work? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, we're excited to see these products uh, come out onto the market and. Judd, thanks for coming on the show. And Greg, thanks again for for coming on and discussing all things Thompson Center with us. Well, I appreciate it, guys. Thank you for the time. And let's do this again. There's going to be many more topics to talk about in the short term. We're looking forward to it. Guys, thanks for tuning in to this episode with special guest Greg Ritz talking about Thompson Center and all of the awesome things that they have on the horizon. We hope you enjoyed it. We'll catch you on the next one.